Mm-hmm. That he gave us, um, and because God already forgave us, so we don't really have to ask God for forgiveness because He already like died for us. Right. That's pretty Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think certainly the Scripture makes it very clear. We need to to ask for forgiveness, but it's a reaffirmation of something that's already occurred. And uh, the things that we do separate us and and distance us from God, and that's what that's for. It, it's not some you know, kind of magic ritual that somehow puts me back in good, God's good graces, which is kind of an odd phrase if you think about it, because how much grace could he pour out, how much more grace could he pour out than what he poured out at Calvary anyway? So, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, Kaylin. I was just curious, um, you did like the list for the prophetic priestly, and then there was also king. Is right. Like a- no, no. I, when I talked, to, I, when I was talking a little bit about the leadership role and that function, that that kind of overarches all the others. So, because ultimately I can lead even when I'm being prophetic, and I can also lead even when I'm being priestly. So, <clears throat> there's not a list for that, partly because it's kind of an or, overarching aspect of it. And, and, you know, again, I, what you have to do when you look at those the concepts like that is ground it, ground it in what you know of Jesus and then say, all right, based on what I know of Jesus, how did he display these characteristics? And when we get there, instead of stuff that's been thrown at us about what leadership looks like and all that lovely stuff, um, I, I think we're probably going to get closer to a model we might, might want to emulate. So, yeah, it's, it, it was left out marginally intentionally. Okay, what else? Any other reactions or questions? Or <clears throat> <clears throat> Yeah. I mean, kind of going off of, like, the grace and Yeah. Um, do you think that the shame that we feel like is of guilt is kind of tied into, like, us trying to forgive ourselves and not being able to? Yeah, you just walked out on a great limb. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I think this is one of those places where, if we, uh, I think I could make a pretty good case where modern psychology has weaseled its way into the language of the church, particularly when we talk about the self, particularly. And so, yeah, absolutely, I, I, I think when it really comes right down to it. <laughs> speaking of limbs. Um, I think when it really comes right down to it, we don't trust grace. I don't think we trust it. We trust shame. And why can I say that? Watch how you try to correct your behavior. Shame is way more efficient. It accomplishes things in such a shorter period of time. Grace does not because grace is displayed in growth rather than simple change. And I think growth is way more complicated than that. So I, I think that's, for all of our pontificating about grace, if you, watch, if, you, if you were to follow yourself around with a video camera all day and be able to listen in to your thoughts when you make a mistake, what we would find, and I say this because I do this, okay? That's why my head is so crazy, because I spectate a lot. Um, what we will find is that we honestly believe, based on how we handle our mistakes, that shame will change us. Because what do we do? We beat the snot out of ourselves and say, what an awful person we are, and we can't seem to do anything right, and I, I am never going to be enough or smart enough or tall enough or beautiful enough or whatever. And what is that? It's all about shame. And we actually think that if I can make myself miserable enough, <laughs> that enough counts. If I can make myself miserable enough, then maybe I will avoid that to avoid the misery. And that, that doesn't change behavior. In the long run, in the short run it does, but in the long run it doesn't. So, <clears throat> you know, a, a lot of people, and certainly in the Christian community, a lot of people would say that, you know, that, that when you hear even, and I, I would probably get shot at, in the Christian community because of the emphasis I, I make about grace. And, and a lot of people will say, because why, why? They're afraid. They want to control people's behavior, and they want to make sure that they stay obedient. I get that. 
on the other hand, and so what they, let me back up, and what they, they accuse somebody like me of is that if you emphasize grace, it will give people license thin. And my, my contention and retort back is if you emphasize grace, you might actually give people a reason not to sin. The, the issue isn't our obedience. The issue is the motivation for our, our obedience. And, and that's, that's what, where the conversation often breaks down, is that it's such a long, arduous journey to cultivate enough of a belief in grace that when I make a mistake, I can say, okay, yeah, I, I'm human. I really hate that part of me. <laughs> being human, um, but I'm going to make mistakes. I can do it differently the next time. And, and that, there's the proof, really, of whether I, or not I actually believe that there's enough grace, not just to save me, but to change me. And, and grace serves a lot of different purposes. I'll be talking a lot about that next Tuesday. Um, because, you know, how many of us, and don't raise your hands, how many of us would be would would kind of confess to the fact that we're all perfectionists. Well, translate that into, I may not be an open legalist, I'm just an internal one. So, more than you bargain for, but, you know. <laughs> apparently these rants are why people come, so I guess i got to do it. Yeah? What time? <laughs> what? Uh, <clears throat> I guess there are... Two of the same one on Tuesday afternoons, I think. Monday, they start at the symposium starts at 6 in the evening. Um, and then Tuesday, there's speakers in the morning. Yawn. Um, and then there are workshops in the afternoon. And so there, I think one is at 1 and the other one is like 3. And they're the same. Of course, with me, they're never the same. So you never know what you're going to get with whichever one you come to. So... <clears throat> yes. Can you expand on what you said about um, grace being growth? Grace being. You said displayed in growth. Yeah, I because yes, our 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 growth is is a commitment to live with our mistakes, not condone our mistakes, but live with our mistakes and learn from them. Grace makes that possible because grace gives me hope. Grace gives me hope that I can change. Shame doesn't, because shame is not only did you do something bad, you are bad, and it will take you the rest of your life to change that badness. Good luck with that. So I think that's, that's why I say that, is that I, I grow because I actually believe grace gives me the hope that I can change. Now, until... We have grace in our lives, accept Christ in our lives, and say, maybe something can be different now. And, and, and the Holy Spirit living within me can inform this change in me. Then I'm going to lean on that and trust that, which means the next day, <laughs> I'm still doing stupid stuff. And if I say, see, there you go, you're just as bad as you were the day before, I'm not going to change. I'm not. I'll get hopeless, and I'll get disappointed and discouraged, and eventually I'll say, ah, what's the use? I'll just look good instead of cultivate the being of who I am to reflect God's glory, not reflect good being good. And that's a different thing because we're going to be tarnished. I mean, we're, we, you're all, you know, we're all crock pots, so... You know, it, it's all very much a part of the, the aspect of that. The funny thing about that, and this is another little offshoot of that, you know, is whenever I mention the, the word cracked pots, is that in, in ancient times in the Greek marketplace, if you go into a pottery store, <clears throat> there, would ha there would be two sets of shelving in that pottery store. Um, one set would be the intact pottery. Um, and that and that would be what, what had been glazed and all of, looked nice and all the other stuff. On the other part side of the store, there would be pottery that would be labeled sincera. Well, this side is sincera, which means without wax, 
Okay? So the, and a lot of times potters would, would fix cracks with wax. They'd put wax in it, glaze it, cover it over, and you wouldn't know that you had a cracked pot, which you did. And, and so that happens in any kind of firing process. A lot of times the, the clay will crack or whatever. So on that side was sincera, which is where we get the word sincere, seer, which means without wax. On this side was all the cracked pots. But the funny thing about it was is a lot of times the cracked pots, the artisans over time, instead of replacing it with, with wax, would replace it with precious metals. And they would become even more valuable because of how they would look. They capitalized on the cracks and filled it with precious metal, and suddenly it was something of beauty. The other one was great. It was sincera. It was without it. And, I, you know, I, I think a lot about it, and I wrote this actually in my blog last spring when we were doing our silent retreat, which is the other thing i got to mention to you guys, um, is, is that <clears throat> the thing that I was... Um, that I, I was meditating on it. That sounds so Christian. Um, I, that I was just kind of cogitating on was the idea of what we do with information. A class like this, for example. Um, it's easy to curate information. I mentioned this at the beginning of class. We tend to collect information. It's kind of like the collector in the Marvel comics. <clears throat> we just collect and curate information it doesn't mean anything to us until we actually do something with it. <clears throat> On the other hand, what I wrote in my blog was, is what we forget about is that we're not collecting pieces of art, pieces of information. We are pieces of art. We are, the scripture makes it very clear, we are God's, anybody remember that verse? God's handiwork, otherwise known as masterpiece. Which, <laughs> he makes masterpieces out of cracked pots. Merry Christmas. Welcome to, to the, the party. Because we all are. Yeah? Is there somewhere we can access your blog? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is at drmitch.com. Yeah. I've been writing for about five years. So there's all sorts of rantings and ravings and other things that I think nobody really cares about, so I just write it anyway. So, <clears throat> yeah? Um, I'm kind of curious with how we go about kind of, um, kind of stopping and preventing our thinking of, of shame. <laughs> uh-huh. It's like when, just a self-awareness throughout the day, when we're like, oh, and then you think of that thought, and then you right. like, is that for shame or is that for grace? Yeah. Is that an active kind of... Well, I, you've described it, Emily. I mean, it, it, it's cultivating a, a self-awareness of that because a lot of times we don't we don't even recognize that we're doing quote unquote doing that with ourselves because it's so ingrained. It's just kind of part of who we are. I mean, <clears throat> how many of you within the last week made a mistake in one of your relationships? Now, don't raise your hands. Don't not. not, not, not. <laughs> Confession's good for the soul, but I, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that later. <clears throat> yeah, two hands, right? We, yeah, I'm all in. <laughs> and how often do you remember that mistake over the next week? And why do we do that? Now, I, I, I made, you know, I'm old enough. I got quite a list. And, and there are a number of them that stand out, and I go back to them and say, Man, you're just such an awful friend. Not a friend that made a mistake that was corrected later. I don't think that. I think I, I'm, just, I'm just an awful person. I can't seem to ever do anything right. And when those kinds of words run through our head, that's the shame piece. So ultimately, it has to do, there are three different things, and Brene Brown talks about this in her books, is we have to d develop a self-awareness, a, a critical self-awareness of it. Secondly, we have to speak that shame to someone who has earned the trust to do that. Okay, That's harder to find than you think. Because I, I made this comment, I think, I think in this class, I'm never sure what I say in all the classes I say, but 
I think I've said, just because you're a Christian doesn't make you safe. So when you find people that share your take, if you will, your understanding of some of these things, that at least gives them a, a beginning point. But until they've earned your trust, do not speak shame to them because guess what they'll do? They'll fashion it into a bat and hit you over the head with it. Interestingly enough, Christians do that with the word of God, too. But you know, that's a whole other rant. So I, I, the, the critical awareness, the, the, the speaking of the shame, and, and then doing something different. So it is really pretty simple, really. It's a lot more complicated than it, than it looks because <clears throat> speaking the shame is the toughest part. And quite honestly, in my way of thinking, the Christian community was designed so that people could speak that shame safely and actually live into grace together. That was the, that was the original design of community. That's why when you read 1 John, when, Paul, when John says... Confess your sins one to another. We all know that verse, right? How many people really do that? Why? Because we don't trust anybody to really handle that with any kind of care, let alone well, how we handle that. We don't handle it with any kind of care either. We just turn it into a weapon with ourselves. Say, see, 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 you can't ever do anything right. You're never going to be enough. You're never going to be whatever, enough. Just fill in the blank. You've got your own list. So, so I, I think there's some, a lot of that. I, I have ever, you know, I've been here 10 years and I've searched and, and challenged students to develop the kind of community that would actually allow that to happen, to speak shame and have somebody say, yeah, me too. Nothing else. No more, no pontificating, no what you should do, what God thinks about just... Uh, yeah, I'm with you. I get it. And guess what? That that in my way of thinking, that trusts the Holy Spirit to do because the work that they have to do is with the Holy Spirit, it isn't with you. Your words are not nearly as profound as you think they are. <laughs> you hanging out with them and saying "me too" is because suddenly I'm human and there's somebody else who's will, willing to admit that they are too, which sounds really kind of obvious. I mean, we get up every morning, we're reminded all the time that we're human. But we, in a lot of ways, we condemn our humanity. And I think I've said this before. I, I, God is, is a way more comfortable with our humanity than we are for one major reason I say that, and that's because he, he is redeeming it. We aren't. We just condemn it. <clears throat> so. Anything else? Yes. So for the unbeliever without the understanding of the grace, yeah. would compel us to change. So is discipline the only thing that the For the unbeliever? Yeah, a lot of times it is. A lot of times it is. The 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 one the one um <laughs> uh, the one not criticism, but the one thing that I point out after reading all of all the major books that Brene Brown has written about gr- shame. The one thing she's missing is grace, and she's not writing it for a Christian audience. She's a person of faith, but that, that came up consistently in all the interviews she had with, with people, is the most shame-resistant people were the people that understood grace. The people who didn't have it could still be shame-resistant, but it was, it was really developed within the com- connection with other people. It, it really wasn't anything else. So, you know, e- e- even we, and you see this in the general community, unbelievers, everybody, is there's still a drive to be connected with other people that are trying to accomplish what I'm trying to accomplish. 24-Hour Fitness has it, you know, groups that they do things with. And everybody uses it that way. And I think for unbelievers, that's usually where it takes them, is my value, my worth, is in a sense determined by the people I'm connected to. And that gives me a shot at, at um, neutralizing the shame-based things that I think about myself. Because somebody else can say, yeah, I get it. I, I've been there before. And I, now I breathe a sigh of relief and say, oh, this doesn't have to destroy me. I can do it a little bit differently. So, yeah, 
the 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 grace gives is is a, a tool if you want to put it that way that a lot of unbelievers just simply don't understand their world is not has it doesn't really have the the weavings of grace through it it, it, it usually it's discipline and you know kind of patterns that they put in place and that changes the behavior over time which it does it does but we, we've got an anchor, and that's what grace offers us as, as believers, is, is we've got an anchor because we've got Christ and we've got his life, and we, we can reflect on how did he interact with the people he came into contact with, and maybe, just maybe, I might want to consider interacting with me the way Jesus interacts with me. Oh, then maybe I'm going to do this differently somehow. So, Anything else? Okay, let me pray, and then uh, let's talk models. <clears throat> let's pray. Father, thank you for a uh, conversation like this that we've had, that we have the opportunity to think and rethink and evaluate and um, uh, maybe even recalibrate some of the things we do. There's so much of what we do that, that um, really rests on the, the unearned, unmerited favor that grace is for us. But it was, it's way more than that. It's, way, it's something that you gave us as, as a gift from, from you that we don't have to earn anymore. We just have to live into it and make decisions according to it and help us and empower us to do that for this day. Nothing else. Maybe for the next hour. That's it. Um, and then we'll go on to the next one, and you'll still be there waiting for us and and ready to pick us up when we drop and start beating ourselves up about it and say, come on, get up, let's do it again. Let's try it again. Thanks for that love and that grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, <clears throat> now for our regularly scheduled program. Um, let me ask you guys this. Well, before I do, let me, let me make an observ- or let me kind of give you a rationale. I had somebody in the other section say, so why in the world are we doing this class? I was like, yeah, that's a pretty good question. Um, <clears throat> and because, you know, and her question was more geared toward, is this class designed to make us think that transformational psychology is the only way to do things? My first reaction is, I'm not here to tell you what to think. I am here to try to equip you to evaluate. And I, I think my hope would be that I can make a reasonable case for the transformational psych is probably the most consistent model, if you will, or viewpoint. So the, the, the thing to keep in mind is um, that the viewpoints come from somewhere. And what I want to introduce to you, and I, I probably won't get through it all today, but you know the, the, the schedule's already blown, so we'll just keep blowing it. So, um, but it, these models that we're going to be looking at are the basis on, on, of which you're reading as a viewpoint. That's, that's where it all, this, this is kind of the, the, the stone from which everything has grown. Um, and these models are, are a way to understand which of those viewpoints fit into one of these models. So these are overarching, and if you want to think of it as a tree, if you will, what you have is a tree throughout four branches. And there are four different models, and from those branches, other things has, have come, and, and namely each of these viewpoints. Some of them, a, a few of these viewpoints have come from only one of these models. Some of them have kind of mixed things together, okay? So a, a, a class like this, I, you know, I, you, it, we, we talk a lot about at the front end about integration, but the problem with that word, of course, is that we're implying there's two domains when there isn't. We're talking about our faith and all the contours and landscapes of our faith, and psychology is one of those contours that we have to look at. And that's, that's my personal opinion, my personal kind of conclusion that we have to understand rather than seeing these things as how do I get these things to fit together, okay? Um, but the question I have for you guys is that if, if you were, you know, I put you, you know, 30, 40 years ago, and, and you were somebody of faith, and you learned about psychology, and you said, there's got to be a way that these things fit together. How would you go about doing that? Where would you start? How would you go about doing that? 
knowing what you know, I know you know you're saying, well, geez, I don't know that much. Okay, that's fine. I use rationality a little about it. I mean, if you were going to try to fit two things together, where would you start, and how would you go about doing that? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. 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 So define what's in those domains first, and then start to figure out if there are places of overlap. Okay. What else? <clears throat> Other thoughts. Yeah. Research both of them like in depth and figure out exactly what each of them are. Like, uh, go to like uh, the Bible and stuff and figure out exactly what it says and exactly mm -hmm. what it's talking about, and then go to psychology and figure out exactly what it says, and then you can find the parallels and figure out where they all. Are. Okay. Finish. And by that time, you're at least seventy. <laughs> no, but I, I, it's fair. I, I think you're 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 expounding on what Emily said, and that is. <clears throat> trying to find out what's in these two domains, have a, a clear understanding of those before I start proposing how do we mix these things together somehow. So if you're going to try to mix them, based on the two comments we've had so far, if you're going to try to mix them together, how do you do that? Yeah? No, that's okay. Yeah, sure. I was going to say, what if you went into it with like a different idea, which is like you say, all truth is God, and so looking at that and trying to discern what you can about truth, and then picking apart why people say that that's different, like why people say one is psych and one is okay. Christian. So how they split up the idea of truth right. and define truth from their domains. Right. So starting with truth, right. gotcha, okay. Other thoughts? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Figure out whose shoulders you can stand on first. Okay. Fair enough. What else? <clears throat> I mean, think in terms of the varieties of people that would approach this subject. Okay. Because. There are, there are a whole group of people that would approach this subject and say, religion is irrelevant. It, it, it really, what's there to talk about here? Psychology is psychology, religion is religion. Let them be alone and just leave them that way. And so, like I said, there's this kind of tension, if you will, that some people are going to say, if I can see it and if I have data to support it, that's what preeminates, you know, what, what, and that's what wins the day because I can actually see it and identify it and quantify it. it the other, the whole other group is going to say it's all about what the Bible says, period. That's it. Science, because of its suppositions and all the other things it brings with it, because it's godless, which I'm sure you probably have heard that word before attached to psychology, too, then I, I don't I don't really want anything to do with it. So you have the dichotomists in the group, okay? It's like keep them separate. I don't want to talk about if I'm we're talking about psychology, we'll talk about that. If we're talking about religion, we'll talk about that, and we'll just keep them separate, and we'll all we'll all be fat, dumb, and happy. <clears throat> and then you have this whole group of people in the middle, right? That starts somewhere. Everybody starts somewhere. You got to right. It, it, and that was the challenge the last time was. You can't know where you're going if you don't know where you are. <laughs> and and all of you have a starting point when you came into this class. You may not have known that you had a starting point, but maybe you do now. Maybe you're still still trying to figure that out. That's fine. But the the, the models that we're going to look at here real quickly are <clears throat> represent different efforts to approach each one of these areas of and, and domains, if you will. Something that I did...
uh, just to make this a little bit easier for you, is a, a worksheet, which makes it a little bit easier to organize this information because there's a fair amount of it. Um, so if, if you want it, fine, take four of them. They're, they're on each side. There are four different models we're going to be looking at. Um, and, and I'll just pass that. Uh, I'll pass one of them around. Nice catch. <laughs> pass that back, and we'll just take two of them. I'm sorry, take two sheets, all right, because you have enough for four, four models. And while that's going around, <clears throat> let, let me introduce the four models, okay? The sheets, the way that they're organized, it allows you to identify what the model is and that each of these four models are a word that captures how they relate the two domains together. Um, and so of, as a word, and you'll understand the significance of it, the of model, the against model, the parallels model, and the integrates model. So, and again, the, these are the big branches of this tree that we would label as trying to bring faith and psychology together, all right? That's the tree. Here's the fir first big four branches of the whole thing. And if you want to fill this in, you can because I'll be answering each one of these, a lot of these models all have a sacred version of it and a secular version of it. Some of them don't have one of them, okay? So... I'll, I'll give you the heads up. There are two of them that have a sacred and secular, and there are two of them that have only a secular and only a sacred. Okay? And that's, that's what goes with these models. I, I make this up just to make it easy for taking notes and so forth. Um, the, the spoiler alert is probably on your midterm. There will be a question about this particular thing. That's what makes this that much more important. So... <clears throat> the first model we have to talk about, really, is what's referred to as the against model. Remember the, 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 the dichotomists, okay, the people out there that want to live on the ends of the teeter-totter. They don't like the middle. They don't like the balance. They would rather sit firmly on the ground, and that's it. So the against model is one, the first model that we have to talk about, and the, the, they're we're going to be talking about the same thing as we already talked about when we said about epistemology, about uh, the, uh, theology and mental health. The, the categories are there that run along the side of the, uh, of the table for you. Okay? Um, and as far as the against model, the only way to discover truth is rationalism and empiricism. That's it. There is no other source of knowledge available to us outside of what we can study, touch, feel, quantify, define, all of those things, okay? So because psychology and religion, and the key word here is religion, we're not talking about faith, and we're not talking about necessarily even Christianity, because psych and religion are built on different bases, different views of knowledge, they, they're completely irre, they're irreconcilable. No reconciliation between them is ultimately possible. Um, science is the only source of truth. Uh, religion is ultimately antithetical to scientific thinking. And so people like Richard Dawkins makes this, yeah. Is this the secular side? Th this is the secular, yes, this is the secular side. There is no sacred in the against model. It's only secular. All right? Remember I said two models are one or the other. This is only secular. So Richard Dawkins is a good example of that. The interesting thing is, being the, the outspoken atheist that he is, is his gun is pointed at religion. It's not necessarily pointed at psych Christianity. Although obviously it, he lumps them all in together because in his mind they're, not, they're no different than Muslim or Hinduism or any of the other major religions in our day. So science is really the only source of truth. It's the only way we can discover truth. There's, there are a, a plenty of people, you know, even in the debate around Christianity and psychology, that still lean this way. They, they give the kind of a, a salutation to religion and faith, 
but they really lean this way. When, when it come, push comes to shove and, they, and you say, how do you know this is true? How somebody answers that question will tell you a lot of which way they lean. If they start quoting chapter and verse of data and research and everything else, you've got a little inkling of the only domain of knowledge that we can make that will be compelling is what we can touch and feel and, and quantify. The, the people that have a broader view of knowledge <clears throat> who say, yes, there is research, that's valid, but there's, a, there's another source of knowledge, and that is what God has displayed for us. And in a lot of cases, the people that are on the scientific community say, well, that's nice, and they kind of patronizingly kind of pat the person on the head, and it says, it's nice that you're a Christian, and they move on, because it's, it's not really compelling to them. And that's... That's really part of what this um, against model is. Now, let me give you some examples. I already mentioned to you before Albert Ellis. Albert Ellis was, was a brilliant guy when it came to helping people change from a non-Christian you know, non, uh, point of view. But he was entirely antagonistic to the faith. And this, this quote is a good example of this. It could well be contended that the more religious one is, the less scientific one tends to be. That's not biased at all, is it? Albert Ellis was brilliant in identifying that our thoughts have a huge impact on how our feelings go. He, 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 was, he was way out ahead of everybody else on that, in that regard. And ironically, he actually stumbled onto biblical truth and hated it at the same time. He would, he would never have admitted that. So that's Alice. Um, and the, the, when it comes to religion and mental health, you can probably predict what this is, what this is going to be with the against model. It's against any reconciliation. That's where we get the word against. It's against any reconciliation between religion and um, psychology. So from this model, they say religion actually has a negative effect on mental health. <clears throat> Just like Ellis mentioned, <clears throat> and religion promotes something that is unhealthy in the psychological makeup of the person. Dependency, inflexibility, rigidity, and bigotry. <clears throat> now, that doesn't sound vaguely familiar from today, does it, at all? Because our, our you know, as Christians, we end up, Saying, well, wait, wait, wait. That's that's not where I'm coming from. That's not how I do things. I don't. But in most cases, the against model view of religion and Christianity is a caricatured model of it. It's an accentuation of the worst characteristics, and that's why it has the. That's why it takes the view that it does. So, in terms of religion and mental health, religion is an enemy of positive, flourishing mental health from this point of view, from this model, okay? Uh, another example from Ellis. In most uh, respects, religion seriously sabotages mental health. Religiosity, pay attention to the words and the terms, religi re religiosity is to a large degree essentially then masochism, and both are forms of mental sickness, you all know what he means by masochism, right? It seems like there are plenty of Christians who delight in, in punishing themselves. In ancient times, we called them the ascetics. They loved to beat up the body as a means of subjecting it to the spiritual component of their, of their functioning. So today, he just brought it forward with the, with the idea of masochism, which is p taking pleasure from pain. And that was his view. <clears throat> of, of how people function. Here's another one. Faith and obedience impair the intellectual development of men. Worship of anything makes you the, worship, makes you the worshiper insignificant. So, who has issues about being important? Because <laughs> wherever somebody's, you know, if you want to understand what somebody's saying, as the saying goes, if you, if you want to understand where somebody stands, first understand where they sit. And, and essentially, somebody who sees faith and, and um, religion, if you will, as, or worship as something that makes me insignificant probably has issues about 
feeling insignificant. Because a lot of times our psychology determines the things we say about theology all the time. <clears throat> okay. So what about psychopathology and therapy? <laughs> Well, in most cases, coming from the against model, the problem is the person's faith, the person's religion. So maladjustments, at least from their way of thinking, come from social and psychological causes. Remember we talked about how the Christian tends to see sin as a cause and also as an effect. The solution is found in some kind of psychological or sociological, which means social relationships, treatment, otherwise known as therapy or talking therapy or whatever. There are no spiritual, since there are no spiritual sources, there are no spiritual solutions. <clears throat> there are only psychological ones from this point of view. And again, that's, that's their take on it and their understanding of it. If I separate the world out into black and white, the world is a lot easier to deal with. Because whatever is in black, I avoid, and whatever is in white, I move toward. So it's very simple to get to the, to the end of that, if you will, and understand it from that point of view. So, psychological causes, sociological, again, therapy is a sociological solution, um, and, and that's, that's the key. But this is only a secular model. Okay? No sacred version. We have nothing to talk about there. It's relatively easy to, to mention or look at. So, <clears throat> since there are no spiritual sources to problems, then there really is no reason to involve spiritual practitioners either. Right? I mean, that, all there is is a psychological component to it. And that's, that's really, simply put, that is the against model. Okay? The next one is the of model. The question would be, what, what, is of, what is it of, if you will? And this particular model <clears throat> is an attempt to find good psychology in religion or find, here's, here's the word, psychology of Religion, okay? So that's where we get this idea. So religion and faith is a subject of study rather than a state of being. It's something to study. And so a great deal of the, the ground, the common ground between psych and religion is found in what we can study about it, if you will. And for the longest time, Classes like this, before we, we turned it over into the whole transformational psych thing, a lot of times classes that were taught, like the integration of psych and theology, which was the name last year, in a lot of other universities, Christian universities too, usually ended up being the study of the psychology of religion. That was what integration was from an of model. That's, that's how they see things. So they go, they're trolling for the spiritual moral aspects of us that is found in religion and says, oh, there it is. That's, that's the overlap. When we talked about um, searching through the domains and understanding them. But they, so both of these views, if you will, psychology and religion, both see people, the person, as a moral spiritual being. Now, it's not spiritual in the sense of what we would think of as far as our Christian faith is concerned. It's broadly spiritual. And, and interestingly enough, that word has gotten, is getting used more and more than, we ever, than ever before. But it's not talked about in terms of faith. It's just the spirituality of people. That, that, that's, that's all we're talking about here. So it's kind of a generic spirituality that, that is part of what we what we understand and look at um, and how we understand it. So what about there is, all right, there is a secular and a sacred version to this. The secular ver version minimizes the, the religious um, nature <clears throat> of the content within or the content of the religious concepts. So they broaden it. So love, we talk about love all the time. And when people talk about love, they don't, they don't talk about love in the sense that it's grounded in when God says clearly, you know, or the scripture says God is love. 
it's not grounded there. God is God is the, the, the beginning and the end of love. Now what? Everything after that is secondary. What we reflect, what we know about it, really comes from being grounded in God. That's not where they're coming from. So they look for metaphors. They, they see Jesus as a good teacher, but not necessarily the Son of God. They take the religious kind of connotations out of it and look for metaphors that, that are human in their understanding and in, in, in their, their grounding of it. So their uh, spiritual revelation is stripped out. There are plenty of things, and if you do that to the Bible, there's still plenty of things to learn. I mean, Proverbs is filled with them, and there's no mention of Jesus or anything like that. It's just it's common wisdom, if you will, and that's really what the Bible ends up being kind of reduced to, is a book of common wisdom, and the metaphors, the things in there in terms of what Jesus talked about, or even his life, are really metaphorical, and we empty them of their spiritual meaning. And that's what the secular version of this particular model does um, in, in terms of understanding it. So when we get to uh, the Bible, it's a book of good psychology. They, they are very clear that there are healthy and unhealthy religions. Um, generally, how do they define what healthy is? It's all in psychological terms. And where are the psychological terms grounded? In, in the, the human being the center of the universe, the human being the ground of truth, if you will. And so healthy ones, unhealthy ones, usually are the more conservative ones. And what they see as authoritarian in terms of telling people what to think and expecting them to do so and having the, the rewards and consequences that are commensurate with thinking rightly or thinking wrongly. The funny thing about that is that a lot of us as Christians still operate that way. We keep, you know, we uh, a lot of times our, the, the sermons that we hear every Sunday are caricatured in other quarters within our culture as telling people what to think. That's how it's seen. Now, we, uh, do we experience it that way? No, of course not. But, but people looking from the outside in... That's how they see it. So the, the idea of sin and guilt and hell and heaven and all of those are seen as authoritarian concepts to keep people in line. Really. I mean, that's, and that's the secular version of this. Okay. The, the, so what about epistemology in the secular sense? It's, it's pantheism. <laughs> you might need extra sheets. Um, is pantheism, humanism, and naturalism are really the epistemology. How do we know? It's scientific. When it comes to religion and mental health, since each person is a spiritual moral being, it's still in a broadly humanistic sense. It's still defined by, by common, if you will, psychology, or even modern psychology. There are lots of religions in the the worldly sense, I suppose, that recognize that, that we have a spiritual moral character. They recognize that. They, they say that, and we need to tell people to what? To be good people. Now, they don't ground it. In other words, uh, you know, how do we determine what good is? Again, that's why I always hound you guys about defining your terms. When somebody says, I just want to be a good person. Okay, what exactly does that mean? Do you define it, or do the people that you interact with define it? And how do you go about defining that? So, the the um, you know when it comes to psychopathology, it's it's based on cultural standards usually as to what's psychopathological and what isn't. It is not. There's no there no discussion at all about sinful choices or the state of the of the person. Um, and the condition of that person. Um, it, it's, it's not part of the conversation here. So psychopathology and therapy, for example, is, is going to look very much like the against model. It's going to look very much like that. Therapy and the sociological kind of solution is, is part of what we're, we're talking about here. So um, psychopathology and therapy, theological definitions of sin are discor discarded. 
terms of psychological ones, some of the, the danger and some of the difficulty with a lot of Christian authors, and I've seen this in, in even some of my colleagues that have wrestled with this integration thing, is w- sometimes we fall into taking a biblical concept and saying what it means in a psychological sense without really without really clarifying or, or making sure it's clear that my definition or my interpretation of that is very flawed because it's mine. We have to understand what, whatever the concept is that Paul talks about. When you guys hear me talk about 2 Corinthians 7, and I talk about worldly sorrow and godly sorrow, Paul had a specific target in mind with what he was um, with what he was driving at and trying to help the Corinthian church understand. When I, when I make the jump to say worldly sorrow is similar to our concepts of shame, I'm not saying that my interpretation is gospel truth. Paul said worldly sorrow leads to death, but there's a lot in there that we have to understand if we're going to understand what he meant. And the context helps us understand that Understanding the Greek and the words that he used helps us understand that. And then we can apply it to our personal lives in the context of shame. So I'm making big leaps when I do that. There are a lot of authors that don't. And they just simply assert that something is something, but it's, it's part of our modern nomenclature that we use to understand it. So good psychology translates valid insights of religion and the word's important, and uses it for good. And that's, that's part, of this, um, part of this particular model. Um, Eric Fromm was one of, well, good example of that. Eric Fromm was a uh, <coughs> disciple, not a disciple, uh, um, a protege of Freud. Spent a lot of time talking about, interestingly enough, love. He spent a lot of time talking about love. But he said, one is struck by the fact that in spite of significant differences, there is a core of ideas and norms common to all of these teachings, the teachings in in Scripture and other places. He must be independent and free and end in himself, talking of humans, and not the means for any other person's purposes. He must relate himself to his his fellow man lovingly. Man must know the difference between good and evil. He must learn to listen to the voice of his conscience and be able to follow it. You can go through all of Scripture and find that there. You can, but it's devoid of the anchoring of the spiritual foundations that we understand. Who gave us this, and and for what purpose did, were we given this kind of um, uh, wisdom and and revelation and all of that? So, the sacred version typically remember the split we talked about. Okay, now we're going to spend a little time on the sacred side. Got the secular out of the way. Now you're on your third sheet or something, right? But the sacred side, remember the split we talked about that happened in the 1920s, where the debate over the purity of scripture and doctrine that led to the the split between uh, theologically liberal traditions and more conservative religion or uh, traditions. Most of the time, the sacred version of this this of model comes out of theologically liberal traditions where Jesus was a good moral teacher. The things he said were good and moral can be applied to everyday life. How The models he gave us to understand how to relate are broadly applicable to anybody, but they take out, really, the, the deity of Christ. So in a lot of cases, they elevate the claims of science and reason above Scripture. Scripture informs those things, but it is a supplement, not central. So at the core, Christianity is simply another way to the truth of the quote-unquote good life. And, And that's kind of, in a sense, that's kind of a Christianity that people feel comfortable with. And... The, the reality is, I mean, when it really, when it comes down to it, Jesus is a divisive character. He was revolutionary. He was so divisive that they murdered him. <laughs> so he was pretty divisive. And he still is today. 
because his claims demand some kind of verdict from us. Now, we'll, we'll do a verdict. We may not say what our verdict is, but it usually always demands that. And this sacred version is really an attempt to kind of preserve the moral teachings of Scripture without all the spiritual kind of faith components to it. Yeah, Caitlin. Um, this is the sacred version of the of model, right? Uh, of the of model, right. So I'm curious, like, I'm kind of struggling to understand the difference between the sacred and the secular, because they're both removing supernatural aspects. Right? Yeah, the, the secular version of it is probably closer to the against model okay. than than the sacred is the sacred one the sacred version of the of model is one that we probably have heard a lot of really in, in even kind of cultural conversations is that that's a lot of times how people see psychology and christianity going together that's the sacred version of it really at the core they look a lot alike you know, at the core, because science always wins the day. Science and reason always wins the day. The only difference between secular and sacred is sacred adds the moral teaching, spiritual teaching of the Bible to it. And that's about it. And and the comparison I've made, uh, I made in another class was, I mean, y- y'all, y'all have shopped or at a store like American Furniture Warehouse and gotten, you know, a cheap desk. And, and that cheap desk looks like it's real wood until it gets wet. And then it falls apart. You know why? The core of it is composite wood. In other words, it's a ground-up version of wood that's held together by a water-based glue. The minute the water hits it, it all falls apart. And all that you have left is a plastic veneer that looks a lot like wood versus real wood. Real wood doesn't have a core. I mean, if we're talking about the difference between disintegrated and integrated, remember some of the discussion that we had and I talked about with the stained glass self? Stained glass self is, is veneer wood. The integrated self is real wood. Over the, over the summer, <laughs> my wife and I decided, bad idea. Uh, to replace the fence along one of our neighbors. Bad idea. And <clears throat> so we had a guy come over and take a look at it for us and give us some ideas and so forth. And he said, if I were you, I wouldn't get rid of any of that wood. And it's like, we're, we're dummies. We have no idea what kind of wood it is or anything. And he, he kind of drugged me over there by my ear and said, feel this wood and look at it really closely. And I said, wood's wood, dude. I don't know. What's the difference? And he said, this is cedar. This is three-quarter inch cedar plank. It has been here for 30 years. It will be here for 30 more. All you have to do is just refurbish it, and it will be great. On the other side of our fence, we have pine. (laughs) 30 years, it will be gone in a pile of dust is really what it ends up. And composite wood, imagine building a fence of composite wood. It would be like one good rainstorm, and you're saying, time for a new fence. And that's oftentimes what ends up even with our own lives. So, sacred version. Um, uh, the the again, I, we're still on the sacred. This they, they share pantheism, humanism, naturalism is still part of even the sacred version. So we've got this veneer on top of it. You know, scripture and religious experiences are the sources of truth, but not supernaturally grounded. So one person's spiritual experience is every bit as valid and, might I add, truthful as another person's. I mean, this is, this is a thoroughly postmodern, before it was really postmodern, way of looking at the integration or the relationship between psychology and, and Christianity or faith. And so there's no supernatural aspect to it here. We talk about spirituality in kind of broad, brushstroke sort of ways, and everybody can be kind of comfortable with that. It doesn't alienate anybody or anything like that. Okay? So the, the epistemology is the same between the secular and the sacred version. It, it, one puts the spiritual and uh, religious experiences 
above or on top of that to make it appear, if you want to put it that way. So religion and mental health, each person is a spiritual moral being. This side of this, this model is uh, usually it emphasizes the, the creative, providential, the word is key, and relational uh, is all part of the core of who we are. But it's providential. It's not divine, it's providential. And oftentimes, even when we use providential, we, we're invoking God, but God in kind of the amorphous sense, not, not in any kind of formed way of understanding. And so all of the, the supernatural, redemptive elements that we find in Scripture are not literal, they're metaphorical. And they're still useful. They're still useful. But they're... they're they're, they're not literal. And, and in a lot of cases, when you interact with people, they, they almost seem to kind of give off this notion that if you see Scripture as literal, you're, you're really uninformed. Because, of, of course, science doesn't conform to it or whatever. Um, and then the, the last component of it is the psychopathology and therapy Sin is a religious symbol for psychopathology, <clears throat> and emotional growth is promoted not so much by the use of spiritual principles, but by psych principles um, in some kind of religious setting or religious metaphors. So in a lot of cases, and, and this is not me criticizing or anything, but in a lot of cases, uh, hospital chaplains come from kind of this point of view, obviously ones that are coming from an evangelical point of view are, are not necessarily, but but it, it, a lot of times hospital chaplains and a lot of people that work hospice and things like that are coming from this kind of point of view. How they go about helping somebody, will they pray with the person? Only if the person wants that. They, they won't see that as a integral part of what they do. It's kind of an add-on, or even better yet, a way to think of it is it's a technique. Prayer would be, and that, and that would be a good example of that. I've, uh, in the past, I've done, you know, my grief and loss class I've done in the winter term, and and at one one year I I've done it for like I don't know eight years or something like that. And one year I had the staff of a hospice here in Lakewood come in and talk to the students. And they, they talked in very broadly religious terms. It was a, it was a Catholic hospice. Um, and, but yet it, there was something missing in how they, how they were talking. And, and so the principles and the way that they approached the person was all sound in terms of psychological principles, but it was kind of an added veneer that they added to it, a spirituality or even Catholicism, that made those people that were more devoted that way comfortable. But it, the psych principles were still kind of the, the techniques, and prayer, prayer was just one of them as an example of that. So the, the problem is, what I think we can point to, is, is that this tends to be very much of a cookie-cutter approach. Um, the, the, the theories and the things that we know about psych are kind of pressed into the dough of Scripture, and then whatever doesn't fit in there is really just kind of thrown away, Everything that fits within it is retained. So notice the, the, the starting point and the direction. The starting point is science, empiricism, rationalism, pantheism, humanism. That's the starting point. It's pressed down onto Scripture. There are things that stay in there, and we hang on to it. The other things, it's like, yeah, it's not, not all that relevant anymore. So it, it reduces Scripture slash religion to psychology and robs it of all the, the spiritual uh, revelational components that go with it and concepts that go with it. And that's the problem with it. <clears throat> Again, like I said, in, in everyday discourse, a lot of times that's, this is how people see integration between faith and psychology, is that the faith is a supplement. It's not a central point. Or it's not a, a, a kind of stance that I evaluate everything else by. My stance is really on science, and I evaluate everything from that point of view. And, I, and again, don't hear me. I'm not demonizing science. It's a great, great tool that we can use. 
but where you start and the direction you take is important. And, and that's, that's really a part of of uh, this particular point of view and where the problem comes in. So, okay, we fill in all the boxes. Need more boxes? We got more up here. Um, so, we've got another one, the third one. Probably not going to get entirely all the way through this. This is referred to as the parallels model. Now, the one, the one thing I want to kind of throw out for you to kind of run in the a subroutine kind of on the side as you're reading through your book is what are the viewpoints fit one of what of these models because parallels parallels does show up I'll, I'll let you figure out which viewpoint is a, is out of this kind of lineage but parallels is parallel but not integrated so they don't connect but they're very very close and they inform one another Okay, so the first thing is, psych is valid and a necessary science or, pro or profession. Now remember, psychology is both. It's a profession in terms of the applied psych with psych counseling and so forth, and then it's a science. Yeah. Is this the sacred or the secular? This is the whole model. We're talking broadly about the model first, and then we'll jump in and be labeled. Okay. Um, Christianity. Uh, is is normal and perhaps uh, helpful, but it's personal and it's social phenomenon. It's seen in a fairly scientific sort of way, objective sort of way. Maybe I should use that term. Both of these things, science and, and faith, science and Christianity, have a rightful place in the conversation around psychology and, and faith. But there is not a lot of dialogue between them. They're close enough together that they can yell at each other. Not yell in the fighting sense, but they can talk to each other. But they, there's not a lot of dialogue between them. So one adds to, you know, psychology adds to faith, adds to Christianity. And Christianity adds to psychology but we're not making any effort to try to bring these things together in, in terms of an integration aspect, okay? So they're, they're parallel to one another and, and useful and each have their rightful place with the other in the model, okay? Um, so the, the, the challenge is, is because they're so close and the gap between them is relatively tight, it's hard to distinguish which is which when it comes to secular versus sacred. Because look how it's defined here, okay? So it's not real clear. The lines between them are not oftentimes real, real clear. So what we have is what we call secular in the sense of an isolation approach. And then what we have is secular in terms of an integration kind of approach. Or a sacred integration, okay? So this is, this is the secular slash isolation aspects of it. Psych and scripture are completely separate with little or no overlap from one another. Really, it is hard to define for since very few psychologists ex has ex have expressed any, any this kind of thinking at all. Um, so the, the parallels, in a sense, the psychologists or the counselors or whoever is coming from this really don't think much about the Christian aspect to it. They're, they really think almost entirely about the psychology or the psychological aspect to it. They're willing to say Christianity and faith is important, but it doesn't really enter into the conversation when we're talking about trying to help people. And, and that's what we mean by the isolation, the secular and the isolation piece. Um, an example of that, a guy by the name of Frederick Thorne said this. He said, a distinction should be made between religion-oriented spiritual counseling and scientifically-oriented personality counseling. Now, the adjectives matter. So it, it must be recognized in the beginning that the theoretical and philosophical foundations of spiritual and scientific approaches are basically different. So they're in parallel, they're respectful to one another, but that's it. You've got to keep them separate. And, and in this sense, it looks a little bit like the against model. looks a little bit like it, okay? 
Um, and on that point, since I'm so good at reading nonverbal cues, goodbye. Okay.